Thank you. Okay, we're going to move right on ahead to uh, Professor Donna Heddle. Uh, Professor Donna Heddle is director of the award-winning University of the Highlands and Islands Institute for Northern Studies. Her research interests are Scottish and Northern Irish Isles cultural history, Renaissance language and literature, and cultural tur tourism. She has led and is currently leading several national and international research and training projects involving cultural tourism, including a project at Vanuatu. And this morning, she's going to be talking about clans, early clearances, and America. Please welcome Donna Heddle. Thank you. Um, far reaching the ones in, in Ireland, certainly, but certainly devastating um, in the results. Uh, yeah, so a census of the US population in 1860 showed 108,518 so called foreign born Scots, a figure which ignores those born in the USA of Scots descent, which made them at that time the sixth largest national grouping. In 1900, the foreign born Scots figure was 233,524. Over the century prior to the First World War, um, a total of almost 8. Um, 136,000 Scots left for the USA alone. Never mind anywhere else in the world. They replenished early settlements. They spread their influence throughout the country from Vermont in the north down through New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Virginia to the Carolinas and Florida down the south and California, of course, in the west. There's no doubt at all that the Scots affected how America's values and history was shaped. They left a permanent mark on the American way of life. Um, and the nature of the Scots, the history, the skills and experience of the immigrant Scots equipped them ideally for the pioneering challenge of moving to America. Now, what I want to talk about now for a moment is Scottish colonisation of the Americas. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these early colonisations didn't quite work out. Um, and some of them were abandoned, but they're all very significant in the development of America and the strong Scottish links that we have with America today. So there were a number of field or abandoned settlements in North America, Canada as well, um, a colony at Darien in Panama, and a number of wholly or largely Scottish settlements made as part of British colonisation, which were themselves rather more successful. So um, as John's asked me to give you an overview, I'll nip through a lot of these settlements right speedily, as we say in these parts, and start with good old Nova Scotia. Now, the first documented Scottish settlement in the Americas was Nova Scotia, in 1621, on the 29th of September, 1621, so we've just missed its birthday, the charter for the foundation of a colony was granted by James VI and I to Sir William Alexander. And in 1622, the first settlers left Scotland, though this settlement initially failed, actually, um, and the colony wasn't really established properly until 1629. The colony's charter in law made Nova Scotia defined as all land between Newfoundland and New England, so it does come into... Uh, uh, modern America to a part of mainland Scotland. And this was later rather handily used to get round the English Acts of Navigation, which caused so much problems in Panama. Now, due to uh, difficulties in obtaining a sufficient number of skilled emigrants, in 1624, James VI had a knacky notion. He created a new order of uh, nobility called the Baronets. Now, admission to this order was obtained by sending six labourers or artisans sufficiently armed, dressed and supplied for two years to Nova Scotia or by paying 3,000 merks to William Alexander, who was the governor of the colony at this time. For six months, nobody actually took up this generous offer of James until he compelled one person to make the first move. In 1627, there was a wider uptake of baronetcies and thus more settlers available to go to Nova Scotia. However, in 1627, war broke out between England and France and the French re-established a settlement at Port Royal, Nova Scotia, which they'd originally settled in 1804. And later that year, combined English and Scottish force destroyed the, the French settlement, forcing them out. And in 1629, the first Scottish settlement at Port Royal was inhabited, but this didn't last long, unfortunately. In 1631, under Charles I, the son of James VI I, of course, the Treaty of Susa was signed, which returned Nova Scotia to the French. The Scots were forced to abandon their colony. But they didn't give up and they moved on to Cape Breton, which was founded in 1625. Um, 
1625, a charter was granted by James VI and I for the settlement of what was called New Galloway, Cape Breton. However, this land was never actually colonised, probably due to the problems with the settlement of Nova Scotia. Uh, East New Jersey was the next major Scottish foundation. It's 1683. On the 23rd of November, 1683, Charles II granted a charter for the colony of New Jersey to 24 proprietors, 12 of whom were Scots. The colony was to be split between an English settlement in West Jersey and a Scottish settlement in East Jersey. The driving force among the Scots was Robert Barclay of Uri, that's in Aberdeenshire, a prominent, prominent Quaker and the first governor of New Jersey. Although the Quakers were an important force making up all of the proprietors of East Jersey, the settlement was marketed as a national rather than a religious endeavour, partially due to the persecutions of the Quakers in the 1660s and 1670s. During the 1680s, around 700 Scots emigrated to East Jersey, mostly from Aberdeen and Montrose, not unexpectedly, we think that Robert Bartley was from Uri in Aberdeenshire. Uh, around 50% of those travelled as indentured servants. From 1685, there was further emigration, albeit unsought by the emigrants, with the deportation of captured covenanters. They were originally to have been placed in indented servitude on arrival, however, they were declared by the courts to be free men, as they had not voluntarily indented. In the 1690s, the pace of Scottish immigration slowed due to opposition by William III um, of England and II of Scotland to these proprietors who supported James um, VII. It didn't pick up again until the 1720s. The initial immigrants to East Jersey um, were Quakers and there were Episcopalians and Presbyterians, but by the 1730s, because of the pattern of immigration, Presbyterianism had become the dominant religion. Until 1697, every governor of East Jersey was Scottish, and Scots maintained great influence in politics and business even after 1702, when East Jersey and West Jersey were merged to become a royal colony. And let's not forget Carolina, which is perhaps one of the places that I felt the strongest uh, link to Scotland when I was there, Stewartstown in Carolina, 1684. Although the province of Carolina was, of course, an English colony in the early 1680s, Sir John Cochrane of Oakwood Tree and Sir George Campbell of Kessnock um, negotiated the purchase of two counties for Scottish settlement. These were intended, with the support of the Earl of Shaftesbury, the leader of the Carolina proprietors, to provide a safe haven for Covenanters. As those Scots, anybody not entirely sure what Covenanters were, they were it was a, a religious movement that was against the introduction of the Episcopalian and the English prayer book into Scotland. Um, and many of them suffered uh, very severe um, fates for um, supporting this particular um, movement. Um, the, so these Scots were given a guarantee of freedom of conscience and autonomous control of their colony, which extended from Charlestown, Charleston, towards Spanish territory. In 1684, 148 Scots settlers arrived to build a settlement at Port Royal, the site of former French and Spanish settlements. This was renamed by the Scots as Stewartstown. In the early studies of uh, early settlements, we, we often find that um, different nationalities give the place the same name, but in their own language, they, and they don't seem to have a lot of imagination. They just keep calling uh, places uh, by the same name wherever they are. So we had a Port Royal in Canada, we've got Port Royal here in Carolina as well. Um, once settled, there were frequent conflict, both with the Indians and with the English at Charlestown. Um, the latter, of course, over English uh, attempts to assert authority over the Scots and rights to the lucrative Indian trade. Um, the Scots, of course, also carried out frequent raids on Spanish allied Indians and raided the Spanish mission at Santa Catalina, as well as encouraging and arming the Indians they traded with to attack the Spanish directly. So in 1686, the Spanish retaliated and sent three ships with 150 Spanish troops and Indian allies to attack Stewartstown. Due to a recent sickness, the Scots had only 25 effective fighting men able to mount a defence, and the town was wiped out. Uh, there was no retaliation by the English, who were warned by the proprietors, that is the coordinators of the colonising of Carolina, not to interfere. Uh, it's, uh, it's not always a joyous tale, the early, the early story, and I come to perhaps one of the saddest of them all, and that's the Darien scheme. In 1695, it's probably the best known of all Scotland's colonial endeavours and the most disastrous. In 1695, an act was passed in the Scottish Parliament, because remember, we still have separate parliaments at that time. We don't have the Union of Parliaments till 1707, which established the Company of Scotland trading to Africa and the Indies and was given the royal assent by the Scottish representative of, of um, William III of England and II of Scotland. And this act gave the company a 31-year monopoly on trade with Africa and Asia, 
authorised it to arm and equip ships and to establish colonies in uninhabited or unclaimed areas of America, Asia or Africa. These powers were similar to those of the English East India Company, which opposed the establishment of a Scottish rival. Capital for the company of £400,000 estimated at one third to one quarter of the liquid wealth of Scotland was raised solely in Scotland due to intrigue with um, um, English merchants and the English government, which prevented shares being sold in Amsterdam and Hamburg, which were the great trading points at that time. The opposition also prevented shares being sold in England, as had been the original intention. In 1696, 2,500 Scottish settlers in two expeditions set out to found the Scottish trading colony at Darien on the Isthmus of Panama. These settlers were made up of ex-soldiers, ministers of religion, merchants, sailors and the younger sons of the gentry to receive 50 to 150 acres each. The government of the colony was run by a committee, um, it's a very Scottish democratic way of doing, the chairman of which changed every two weeks, thus preventing any real sustained progress in solving the actual problems faced by the settlers. So it looked good in theory, but it wasn't necessarily the best way to manage it in practice. These problems included a lack of provisions due to famine in Scotland, the Scots' lack of colonising experience, diseases such as malaria, poor weather, and the proximity of the Spanish, who claimed the land the Scots had settled on, um, also for a trading colony established to trade with passing ships in both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, they carried a poor choice of trade goods, including wigs, shoes, Bibles, woolen clothing and clay pipes. Not very exciting. The colony received no assistance from the Crown or English colonies in the West Indies or Jamaica, despite this having been promised in the, in the 19, 1695 Act. Um, so the Scots faced assault by the Spanish on their own. In 1699, they dealt with this by recruiting a Jamaican captain to raid Spanish shipping as a privateer though this achieved little. Soon thereafter, the Spanish mounted an expedition of 500 men to wipe out the Scots. This was effective, as most settlers had already succumbed to disease or starvation. And actually, in point of fact, three of my ancestors died in the Darien scheme and lie in Panama. So a very tragic tale of a, a very good idea, um, which uh, really didn't come to pass. And of course, it had repercussions later on for the state of Scotland. But we still remember it because there was Darien in Georgia, which was founded in 1735, and Darien was a Scottish settlement in the, what was then the British province of Georgia, named after the Darien scheme, although it was for a, a certain period of time known as New Inverness, which is quite interesting. It was founded in January 1736 by 177 Highland Scots, men, women and children, recruited as settler soldiers by General James Oglethorpe. They had a dual role of establishing a new settlement and acting as a buffer, protecting the rest of Georgia from the Spanish in the south. The Scots quickly established a number of military forts in the surrounding area and after initial poor success in farming, concentrated on cattle rearing and the felling of timber for survival. Um, in 1739, you might be interested to know that 18 prominent members of the colony signed the first petition against the introduction of slavery into Georgia. This was in response to pleas to Oglethorpe and the trustees by inhabitants of Savannah to lift their prohibition on slavery. The Highlanders' petition was successful and slavery was not introduced until 10 years later in 1749. Despite conflicts between Jacobite and Hanoverian settlers, the colony did reasonably well, with additional settlers arriving in 1737 and 1741. However, there was frequent conflicts with the, the Spanish and the Indians that were allied with them. On the outbreak of the War of Jenkins' Ear, which surely must be the best title for a war ever, if you can indeed say that about a war, that was October 1739, the Scots seized five Spanish forts and attempted a siege of St Augustine. However, they were defeated in the subsequent Battle of Fort Moss that resulted in the death um, and capture of uh, 51 of the Darien settlers. Despite this, Scottish settlement in Georgia continued. Now, if we look at contemporary maps, contemporary cartography speaks volumes with hundreds of towns and cities of varying size and importance bearing Scottish names in memory of the Scots' contribution to American history and early civic development. Uh, the legacy of Scotland lives on in the multiple Scotlands, Aberdeens, Berwicks, Glasgow, Stirling, Stuart, Stornery, Orkney, and other distinctly Scottish place names that vividly recall early settlements of Americans of Scottish birth or descent. Um, for, I remember when I was in uh, Illinois at a conference, a uh, taxi driver asked me where it was from. And I said, Scotland. He said, is that Scotland in Connecticut? And no, it's your actual Scotland, <laughs> but certainly the place names are very prevalent. So it's been estimated that today up to 15 million Americans can claim Scots ancestry 
uh, i.e. as many as 1 in 18 US citizens. Their Scots-American heritage is reflected everywhere in Tartan Day, which I was fortunate enough to attend this year, uh, St Andrews and Burns Societies and Highland Games, American Presbyterian and so on. Um, in, uh, in addition, it stands out in renowned achievements in engineering, science, industry and the arts, while it's integral to each fundamental, uh, fundamental American institution, such as uh, the Declaration of Independence. Lots of people and writers and historians have drawn attention to the influence of the Scots in various books, um, and they, they trace a number of Scottish-American adventures, exploits and achievements. Um, if you look at one of the prominent families, for example, is Carrick Buchanan of Drumpeller and Corswell, whose ancestors traded in Virginian tobacco from the 16th, this, I beg your pardon, 17th century, later also investing in American sugar and cotton plantations. Another branch of the family produced the 15th President of the United States, President James Buchanan. As Oliver Wendell Holmes, the renowned US Supreme Court Justice, who was, of course, of Scots descent, said, many ideas grow better when transplanted into another mind than in the one where they sprung up. Um, and certainly, it's, it's the very essence of the way in which Scottish ideas, values and initiative and a historic yearning for making their own way in the world have been able to take root so extraordinarily well in fertile American soil. So we started off with a whole lot of entrepreneurs. It didn't always work out for them, but they were entrepreneurs. They were there, there under their own steam. So what happened that changed this emigration to forced clearances? What happened? Well, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today, particularly because I do think it's very significant, is um, the rise of the clans. If I could have my next slide, please. Here we are. I hope you can see that all right. It's clan structure. I'm going to talk you through it. And I just want to talk about the clans because some people have very interesting ideas about what the clans were. I mean, essentially, a clan is a social group made up of a, a number of distinct branches and families that actually uh, descend from them or accept themselves as the descendants of a common ancestor. The word clan, of course, means simply children, clan, as in clan Donald, the children of Donald. The idea of the clan as a community is necessarily based around the idea of hereditary and is most often ruled according to a patriarchal structure. For example, the clan chief represents the hereditary parent, if you like, of the entire clan. Um, and if you look at the clan structure there, it is quite a stylized and complex structure. At the top, you've got your chief and supreme leader. Um, now, uh, this is not to be confused with chief, then this is, uh, chief is entirely different. Then you have the Tanist, who's nominated by the chief, and, and that whole idea goes right back to the, the concept of Celtic tradition in which the chief selected the best of the next generation to follow him, the Tanist. You'll notice that in the Irish government, the Taoiseach is the leader and his deputy is the Tanist as well. So it's, it's, it's a recognised term. And then you have the commanders of the military leaders, and you know that sometimes when um, clans don't have a chief in the modern era, sometimes they have a commander. Um, and then you have the chieftains, the Fina, and these are the heads of the various branches or sets of the clan, and they're always appointed if the chief were old or infirm. And then you have the taxmen, the ones who have the blood connection with the chief. In many ways, in the structure of the clan, they're a bit like the civil servants. There's a lot of the logistics and organising. And then, of course, the clansmen and women, uh, the greatest in numbers. In times of peace, they did the work. In times of war, they fought for their, their chief. Um, the, the, the clan chiefs, of course, the... the uh, this whole concept of clan starts very er early on in Scottish history. It's got its first definite manifestation in the Kingdom of Dalriada, in what's now Argyll, founded by the group of Scots that settled the west coast of Scotland in the early 6th century. Um, this settlement was actually it was established by Fergus, son of Argyll, it was, um, along with his brothers, Lorne and Angus, um, and they divided the territory amongst four tribes, Kinnell Gavram, Kinnell Gomble, Kinnell Lorne and Kinnell Angus. Um, which, uh, so the clan system is very much based on this early Scots or Celtic system of kindreds, 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 right. Um, and the formation of the Highland clans was also heavily influenced by the, the tribal territories of the Picts. So you combine the ethnic heritage and the geographical location. Um, and it was uh, certainly a very uh, s s interesting way of managing a community. Um, the, the clan chiefs were recognised officially um, due to the um, intervention of Queen Margaret of Scotland, you might be surprised to know, uh, Queen Margaret of Scots, I should say, the proper title, 
Uh, during the 11th century, when Queen Margaret, of course, the wife of Malcolm Canmore, exercised great influence over the chief and brought in a number of southern customs. And one of the, uh, the customs was something along the lines of a feudal system. Under the Celtic system, the patriarchal system, all land was the property of the clan or, or tribe. That's why we don't have kings or queens of Scotland. We have king, kings and queens of Scots because they have sovereignty over the people and not the land. Uh, <clears throat> so what happened was that um, we, this relationship slightly changed. It didn't significantly alter the internal structure of the clan, but it, the relationship between the sovereign and the clan chiefs was significantly changed. The clan was required to be officially received in the person of its chief by the crown as an honourable community in the Communitas Regni Scotiae. So it becomes a more formalised arrangement at this time. And it's interesting to note that clans consisted of native men, those who were born into the clan, and broken men, those who joined the clan. And sought the, uh, they, they had perhaps uh, reneged from other clans and, and sought the protection of a particular clan. Um, so the clans, it's very much like a cooperative, it's a community, it's a system that was based on barter in, in the mains. So what happened? It had huge power. Um, these clans, a lot of them were in um, very remote locations, and a lot of them, like the, the Lords of the Isles, um, Clan Donald of the Isles, for example, were so secure in um, their, their might that they built their main, um, their main seat at Finlagan on Isla, which is absolutely indefensible. It's in a completely flat, open space. I mean, they're basically there saying to everybody, come on if you think you're hard enough, come and get us then, because they had such power. So Edinburgh and indeed London as well, thought what they could do to break clan power. And what they did, one of the first things they did, was something called the Statutes of Iona in 1609, to which clan chiefs did sign up, unfortunately. But the main objective there, although it didn't bring down um, the clan uh, system completely, that really happened more after Culloden and the Jacobit Risings, what it did was it basically dynamited the foundations of the clan system. And one of the most important things was that the clan chiefs and their heirs had to go to Edinburgh or London to be educated. What this meant was that, first of all, they, they lost their proficiency in Gaelic, or they didn't learn it at all. Secondly, they discovered what money could do for them. Now, bear in mind, the whole clan system is based on a kind of central barter system, to all intents and purposes, some coinage, perhaps, very little indeed, really. Then what happens there is there's a disjunct. It's no longer the children of Donald. It's the commodities on the land that are looked for. So the clan chiefs came back and they saw what a luxurious life they could have with money and things like that. So the, the whole link, the whole bond, the reciprocal bond between the chief, the, the father of the clan and his clan was broken. And that really was the fundamental issue about what happened with the, the Highland clearances to all intents and purposes. The breakup of the clan system during the 18th century caused massive emigration from the Highlands from the 1760s onwards to the cities and to the lowlands, not always out of the country, but to Glasgow and to Edinburgh and to Dundee and to lowland Scotland and also to America, of course, first to the Carolinas and Albany, New York, and after the American War of Independence to Canada, Prince Edward Island, Cape Breton, the eastern provinces and central Canada. Um, from the 1840s, emigrants began to favour Australia and New Zealand, actually. Uh, could I have slide four, please? Next slide, please. Uh, if you skip over that one, thank you. This is the kind of uh, no, no. If you go back to the thank you. Um, this is the kind of image that we all recognise from this particular period. This is the Lochaber no more. This is the um, the forced eviction of the clan there. Um, and um, one group, for example, from Assent, led by the Reverend Norman Macleod, moved first to Canada in about 1820, and then in 1850 to Waipu in New Zealand. Successive waves of emigration took place, um, mostly connected to the Highland clearances for sheep farming and periods of destitution. One of the most significant things that happened was what we call the Year of the Sheep. In fact, there's more than one, but this is the first one, Bleana Nakurach in 1792, in which the landlords saw that they could make more money from their land by removing people and putting sheep on it. Now, we've got to remember at this time in the Highlands and Islands, population was huge. Um, Sutherland and Caithness and all of these places now that rank as European wildernesses were massively overpopulated at the time. When you go there and you look at these glens with the little ripples of stones there, that was thronged with people. That was not a wilderness. That was not a remote place. That was a thriving community. 
Um, there were government inquiries as to why people were being moved off the land, um, but not until later in the century was emigration officially controlled, and usually by the colonies themselves. Um, and emigration has continued at a high rate into, well into the 20th century. For example, between 1850 and 1950, the Highland population declined by at least 100,000 people. And wherever they went, they carried their language and their culture and traditions with them and eased their pain and their homesickness by transporting to the new lands the place names of their homeland. Glengarry, Glenelg, for example. Now, Glengarry is a particularly interesting example. I know it's Canadian and, um, um, and so on, but um, the MacDonald of Glengarry, after Culloden, saw that the, you know, the game was up and he took his entire clan in a body, Taxman, Fina, the lot, and they all went to what is now Glengarry County in Ontario. It was actually a very wise move for his clan, actually. And the Highland Clearance is a very emotive subject. Um, if we look at it objectively, if we associate it with a progress of economic and agricultural change, which was widespread across Europe at the time, it's undoubtedly part of the agricultural and industrial revolutions. And yet it's more than that. Other writers condemn the process, seeing as a kind of eth ethnic cleansing. There was a kind of pseudo-racist um, theory going about at that time that the Celts were in some way inferior. Uh, quite a few writers wrote that the best thing to do would be to clear the highlands of Scotland of Celts and populate it with Germans, as a lot of Germans were emigrating at that time due to revolutionary state in their own country. Um, but it undoubtedly stemmed in part from the attempt of, uh, by the British establishment to destroy, once and for all, the archaic militaristic clan system because it had facilitated the Jacobite arising. And that is true, but it's a bit oversimplistic too. There were people on the make, there were some landlords were very cruel, some, some landlords bankrupted themselves to try and look after the people after the potato famine, for example. Um, the potato famine in Scotland uh, began in 1846. There was a succession of bad harvests, there was famine, there was a rising population, there was pressure on lands and jobs. There were all of these things. There were fast-talking, smooth agents of ship owners who ferried indentured servants to the rapidly expanding United States of America. The people got here and they discovered that they signed up for something that they really hadn't. In some cases, the final decision to go was a voluntary one, a desire to seek something better across the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. And all these factors played, played a part in causing the Highland clearances and the, and the results have had a lasting significance for the people of the Highlands and indeed for many of those who left. And a lot of those ships could have my next slide, please. Thank you. This is the Hector. This is, uh, it's now, it was a rotting hulk that took early settlers across to the Americas. Um, they could pick pieces of wood off the side of the ship. So soft was the wood. Food was incredibly bad. They were marooned out at sea for a long time, and many of them died of illness. It's now been restored and is in Pictou County in Canada. Of the emigrant ships that sailed to America, 47 didn't make them across the ocean, didn't make it across the ocean. What was it like inside? Could we have the next slide, please? Oh, next slide. And the next one. And the next one, please. And there's another example of ships, but if you just give me the next slide. There we are. That shows you a little bit. There's a little dark picture because it was a dark place, the very cramped space that they had there. You can just see the, the trunk that they might have had. Next slide, please. There you are. Each family had a great big kist. Well, no, it's not that big a kist. What would fit in your kist? What? Just think for a moment, ladies and gentlemen, what would you have taken if you were leaving your home never to come back again? You're taking your Bible and your Sunday clothes, maybe some seeds, maybe some mementos if you had any, things like that. But one kiss was for the whole family. Yeah, really quite moving indeed. Um, so all these people went there. They, they did get there. They did flourish. Um, that is true. They, they flourished wherever they went. And let's not forget that we put a Scots-American on the moon in 1969. And one of the first places that he went after he went to the moon, Neil Armstrong, was his father's home in the borders of Scotland, where he received the, the freedom of the village. And he said, he was a man of few words, Neil, as we know, he said, I have come home, which was rather nice of him. Um, but we, we, we did flourish. But what was left in Scotland then? The Scots who left flourished. What was left in the Highlands? The, the Highland clearances transformed the cultural landscape of the Highlands of Scotland probably forever. 
In the space of less than half a century, the Highlands became one of the most sparsely populated areas in Europe. And it should be remembered the Highlands and Islands comprise an area bigger than some industrialised first world nations such as Belgium or Holland. But it wasn't just the people that, va that vanished, the settlement pattern vanished. The homes of the peoples for a thousand years or more have virtually vanished, becoming no more than an archaeological feature for those who stumble across it. Uh, once they were cleared, structures uh, quickly reverted to nature and little or nothing was to replace them in the new economic order. View the landscape today and you'll see sporting estates and auriculostines and some sheep and the glen stands empty. But I don't want to leave you feeling too gloomy about these things. So I just want to just remind you, in case you forget, just how much influence Scott's inventors, for example, have had in your life. Now, when you got up this morning, you turned on your clock radio, perhaps, beside your bed, invented by Scott. And you heard that it was going to be raining. So you thought you'd, you'd put on your Macintosh, invented by Scott. And instead of taking your bicycle, invented by Scott this morning, you thought you might take your car with the special tyres invented by Scott and you'd drive over the road surface, the Tarn Academy road surface, invented by Scott. However, you were stopped in your tracks by a phone call, phone invented by Scott, of course, and you were informed that somebody would come and give you a lift. So in that case, you proceeded through to the kitchen where you opened the fridge, invented by Scott, you took out your loaf of bread, you put your bread in the toaster, invented by Scott, and you had your breakfast. <clears throat> yeah, if you're not feeling very well, just like me, you maybe had some uh, penicillin or antibiotics invented by Scott. If you're unfortunate enough to be diabetic, you would have taken your insulin, discovered by Scott, and you would have injected it with a hypodermic syringe, invented by Scott. Just at that moment, the door goes and a letter falls through um, your, your uh, letterbox. So I know in America you don't really have a letterbox, so it's probably one of these... Um, post box things and on that is a, an adhesive stamp invented by Scott and that's even before you got out of the door this morning so let's be very positive and cheery about the whole Scottish situation all round. Now I'm just going to finish up, I'm conscious of time, I'm going to finish up by just telling you a little bit if I can have the next slide please and the next that for anybody that's interested is the Nahelerich, the emigrants um, statue at Helmsdale, which commemorates all the people that left from the, left the Highlands and Islands. Next slide, please. There we are. Now, John wanted me to finish by telling you a little bit about our Emlet Scottish heritage, brought to you by the University at the Heart of the Highlands. That's us. And what that is, is a purely online programme, which you can do module by module, in which we look at aspects of Scottish um, heritage and how to market them and how to be able to use them in your businesses. So we have modules called uh, Scotland Story 1, which is uh, Mesolithic to Medieval, Scotland Story 2, which is um, Medieval to Modern, Scotland's Voice 1, which is uh, Language and Literature, Scotland's Voice 2, which is Music and Song. We also have uh, Scotland's Customs and Beliefs, and we also have Marketing Scottish Heritage. Um, so if anybody's interested in, in finding out more about that, the details are on the screen and you can contact me, but you can do each module in your own time from your own computer with um, well-renowned academics and experts to teach you. And we're very much looking forward um, to starting this teaching adventure, which starts this year. So I'm conscious of time, which is why I've nipped through a few slides, but I will stop there and I will ask if there are any questions. Thank, thank you, Professor Heddle. Your presentation has been very much appreciated here. Are there any questions? We have, we have time for one, if there are any questions. Well, okay, if there are no questions. I, um, I have just... one for you. Oh, how exciting. On you go. Um. In my family, back in the 1800s, we were lucky enough to have a couple uh, in our family that did some writing in the book, and they talked about the reasons for leaving being religious persecution. Yes. And I wondered how much that had to do with it. There were, uh, for example, uh, uh, people in the Episcopal Church talked about being persecuted by Catholics or Presbyterians. And uh, apparently that was serious enough that uh, that was said to be a reason for our family to move. Yes, there was certainly a lot of... Um, one of the 
um, uh, motivations behind the clearances was um, to get rid of Catholics in the Highlands and Islands. That was certainly one of the reasons. The Covenanters, of course, were uh, Presbyterians who were persecuted for being Covenanters, for not wanting to take on the Episcopalian, uh, the nature of the Church of England, which Charles I was attempting to foist upon them. Um, anybody who's a big fan of uh, Sir Walter Scott will, of course, instantly recall uh, old, old Mortality, which very much deals with this period in Scottish history. Um, I'm afraid to say that people have always been picking on other people for various reasons throughout history, but c certainly religion will have played a, part, uh, played a part in that. As I was saying with some of the early settlements that were founded by Quakers, for example, because they, were, they suffered persecution at home. Um, the same can be said for uh, Episcopalians and Catholics. Uh, Epis Episcopalians, not so much, I would say, compared to other groups, but certainly they will have um, experienced that as well. It will all be, it's a, it's a quite a, a melting pot or a soup pot of factors that cause people to leave. Professor Heddle, thank you so very much for a very interesting presentation. Thank you so much.